his right and left lungs, as well as all the air passageways that move air into and out of the lungs. The upper respiratory system includes the nose, the nasal cavity, the pharynx, so the throat. The lower respiratory system includes the host box, the larynx, the trachea, the bronchi, the lungs, and the ever important muscular diaphragm. Starting with the nose and nasal cavity, the nose is divided by the nasal septum and right left sides. On either side of the nasal septum, there are these bony projections called the turbinates. And you can see them here on the hat. The bony projections right here, sometimes called the nasal conchi, but the turbinates, so I call them. There's three of them right in here. Could you show them here? Sorry. Three of them right in oh, here. Oh, I see them. Like the okay. And the purpose of these is to help direct the airflow and breathe air and through your nose. And of course, there's a mucous membrane that covers the line of the nasal cavity. So as you breathe in, air does not just go straight back, sort of whips around those terminates. I think it was down. The reason for this is because our lungs are in warm and moist environments. What that means is we want the air going into our lungs to be warm and moist. So by moving around those turbinates, it allows them to pick up some moisture if it's dry, if it's dry and some heat as well. Did I mention that the lungs are a warm, moist environment? Yes. So we want the air going in to be warm and moist. The nasal cavity continues posteriorly until it reaches the pharynx. Notice here I've included mast cells. We saw this in an animated video earlier in the plot. When we were talking about um, inflammation. And mast cells in the tissues are going to release histamine, which is going to cause vasodilation. The best would look this. Vasodilation is going to increase the amount of blood flow to an area. And it's also going to increase the permeability of the vessels so that cells can move from blood into the surrounding tissues. Remember, if they're inside of the blood vessel, there is a wall. And that wall has to open up and allow those white blood cells to move from in the blood into the tissues. So this is where mast cells help out. The throat or pharynx begins where the nasal cavity ends. Uh, it also has a mucous lining. Remember, it's divided into those three sections naso, oro, and laryngeal pharynx. I think we saw that. Didn't we head ears, eyes, nose, and throat? Mm -hmm. I, said, I think we saw that in the head ears, eyes, nose, and throat mm -hmm. section. Mm -hmm. The larynx um, is the pharynx. As the throat descends, it divides into two tubes. One tube is a food tube, one tube is an air tube. The beginning of the air tube with the larynx is where we find the true vocal cords, the, those V-shaped flaps of tissue that are going to create the sound. Uh, remember, there is a very important lid-like structure at this junction called the epiglottis, which is going to keep food from going down the wrong tube. Or coffee, as the case may be. Just below the vocal cord begins the trachea. The trachea. The trachea has to remain rigid because of the change of air pressure created by the diaphragm contracting and that movement of air in and out through the trachea. It could collapse under the air pressure. So to strengthen it, the trachea has cartilage that goes around it. However, and this is important to remember, the trachea does not go all the way around it. It is not a circle of cartilage around the trachea. It is a C-shaped cartilage around the trachea that is on the anterior portion of the trachea. And the reason for that is because the esophagus is right behind the trachea. 
so that when we swallow, the esophagus has the ability to expand and push that bolus of food down and it expands into the posterior aspect of your trachea. So the cartilage is C-shaped on the trachea, on the anterior surface of the trachea. C-shaped cartilage. You may have heard that somewhere before. Moving on to the bronchi. So the trachea descends and it branches off into an inverted Y shape, which makes the right and left main stem bronchi, bronchus singular, right bronchus, left bronchus. Now the bronchi have part which encircles them completely because they don't have to worry about having anything behind them. Uh, each bronchus enters a lung and branches off into many bronchioles. The bronchioles have smooth muscle in their walls. So these are tubes with smooth muscle in their walls, which of course are going to allow for dilation and contraction, which is going to direct airflow. The tracheobronchial tree contains specialized cells that have these finger-like projections called cilia. And remember that cilia have a job that they do. Cilia sweep. And what are they going to sweep? <coughs> Particles, mucus. Particles that are trapped in mucus. And in which direction are they going to sweep these particles? Up and out. In this case, up. So these finger-like projections are not sticking out of the cell. This is all cell membrane. Which means there is machinery that runs up into these that causes them to do their job, which again is going to be sweep. And in this case, they're sweeping up to get that mucus with those trapped particles swept up to the point where you can swallow them or pop them up. Because mucus is going to trap things like we want mucus to do, but we don't want to just trap things. We want to get them out also. So the mucus traps them, but then we want to move that mucus out. Yes? Which one goes down? I'm sorry? Which one goes down? Goes down what? Which cilia moves down? The pharynx? That's the throat. <clears throat> you say, you see how um, the mucus go up? No, I'm saying, I'm saying this mucus gets swept up. Mm -hmm. Like we cough it up. Because the cells that we have lining the tube sweep that stuff up. Nothing's going to sweep down. No, not sweep down, but you refer to something that's going down. Both, all this, I'm just going in a downward direction, starting from the top. Oh. Where we have the nasal cavity here, then it's going to become the pharynx, which is going to be the nasopharynx, the oropharynx, and the laryngopharynx, and then that's going to branch off, I'm going to branch off wildly here, into two tubes. Obviously, it doesn't branch off quite like that. They're right behind each other. But one, of course, is going to be the food tube, the esophagus. Food goes down this way. And the other one's going to be the air tube, where air is going to move in and out. So this is what is going to be the larynx and the trachea, and then it branches off into the lungs. So that's a bad lung. There we go, it's a bad lung. So right. which one is the food tube? The esophagus. Esophagus. The back. And then we're going to treat the air for the air. Yes. I'll show you a picture. <coughs> Oh. 
Okay, let's do it this way. We'll start out at the top. So this is the nasal cavity here. And of course you can see the turbinates. They call them nasal conchi. I call them turbinates. Superior, middle, and inferior as well. And then that goes down and this becomes, this is actually, you can think of this right here as a tube, the pharynx. This is the throat, all of this. Nasopharynx, oropharynx, laryngopharynx. And then that branches off right here. You see now there's two tubes. So we have one tube that becomes two tubes. The tube in the front is going to be for airflow. This is going to take air down to the lungs and back to the lungs. And then right behind it is the esophagus, food tube. There's our epiglottis, that's that lid that's going to flip over so that food is directed down the food tube, down the esophagus. Um, And as it descends, the trachea branches off into two tubes. One goes into the right lung, one goes into the left lung. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. As it goes into the lungs, it branches off to the smaller branches. And all those smaller branches eventually branch off into the smallest branches, which then end in these clusters of elbow lines, which are like balloon like sacs. These are um, these very ends of all those branches. This makes up much of the lungs. These are all air sacs. As we breathe air in, air is going through here. It fills up these little spaces. And again, it's kind of easy to think of them as being like balloons that would inflate and then deflate, sort of. But it's easy to think of it that way, so that's why I use that example. So as you breathe in, they can inflate like this. You breathe out, they can kind of deflate like this. And you'll also notice that the blood vessels, the capillaries here, are going directly over across the alveoli. They're lying right on top of that. So as blood is coming from the right side of the heart that's low in oxygen, it flows across here. Those red blood cells go through these capillaries, and now oxygen moves from those alveoli across the membranes and into and on the red blood cell, taking those seats and hemoglobin. And what's the driving force behind that? Behind what? The movement of oxygen. What's your driving force? Yeah, what causes the oxygen to move from? Oh, the concentration gradient. Concentration gradient. Remember diffusion? They put a whole lot of particles on one side of a membrane. As long as they can move across, they're going to move across until the concentration is even. So the concentration is more inside the capillaries? No, it's more when you breathe in, inside the alveoli. Oh. Okay. And then the red blood cells moving through here are lower in oxygen. Gotcha. The concentration is lower, so it's going to move across all those membranes into the red blood cells. I inside. I'm sorry? I inside. The concentration gradient was inside, higher inside the capillary, not of oxygen. Carbon dioxide, the concentration is greater in the capillary. But the alveoli, it doesn't, like it doesn't drop the, the CO2 off in the alveoli, right? Yes, it does. Oh, wait, yes, it does, because then we breathe it out. This yeah, is the exchange. Is why it's my question. Well, one is to breathe it out. Yeah, this is the exchange. Oxygen goes into our blood, carbon dioxide comes out of the blood. One for one. Not, I mean, not necessarily one for one, but 
I was going to say the concentration would be the same. Yeah. So this is, this is where the gas exchange takes place. Mm. This is where we're actually crossing the membrane. Because remember, I can stick a wire up your nose into your nasal cavity, go down into your nasopharynx, your oropharynx, laryngopharynx, down to the larynx, down into the trachea, down to the bronchi, the bronchioles, to the terminal bronchioles, all the way into this spot right here, into an alveoli, without going through a single membrane, or it's through a single door. So it's like so that's still outside of the body. Hasn't gone across a membrane or across a doorway yet. That's awesome. Through a doorway. But once it crosses that membrane, now it's inside of the body, or vice versa, carbon dioxide will be out of the body. Does that make sense? Yeah. You understand it, folks? Let's look at the lungs for a minute. The lungs fill most of the thoracic cavity. Spongy air filled structure dividing the lobes. The right lung has three lobes. The left lung has two. Why is the left lung smaller? Because they the heart. The heart takes up some of that space. Very nice. The apex of the lungs is located at the top. Of, <coughs> or we can say the top of the lungs is referred to as the apex. This is different from the heart. The apex of the heart is actually the tip at the bottom. So the heart apex is at the tip of the bottom. If you want to find the apex of the heart, you go to the mid-clavicular line on the left side, left mid-clavicular line, go down just below the fifth rib, and that's where you'll find the apex of the heart. Uh, I have here a hilum is the press region, where everything either goes into or out of an organ. Uh, we'll see that again with the kidney, so don't worry too much about that right now. The bronchioles end in clusters of specialized air-filled sacs called alveoli. Each alveolus expands and fills with air and contracts and leaves the lungs. And there's a very important um, compound called surfactant that helps to keep the alveoli from collapsing with each breath. Remember, this is not created until about week 22. Uh, in the uterus, and it's not really functional until about week 24 to 26. This is the last thing that has to be done in order for that baby to survive in this world. The baby has to be creating enough surfactant in its lungs. If it is not, the baby won't survive in the world. <sighs> won't get agreed. This is what the doctors say when they, this is what the doctors mean, excuse me, when they say the baby's lungs aren't mature yet. They don't mean it hasn't grown to the right size, it means it's not producing surfactant. This is the last thing that will cause or allow. This is the last thing that will allow a child to be born and survive in this world. Because is their brain still developing? Yeah. Yes. Could they still be paralyzed? Yeah. Brain damaged? Yeah. yeah. Could they still be blind? Yeah. Yeah, because their eyes are still developing. They could have vision problems, but they can survive. Without surfactant, that's it. What happens? So that's if the baby come out within the 24 to 26 weeks, right? Before 24 Before, to 26 okay. weeks. So how about after? It won't. After it will be fine. By that time, it's making enough surfactant. And we can give mom something to help baby make some more. Is it possible for it to be born without that? What will happen is those alveoli will stick together. So if that baby's born and into our world, takes a breath in, breathes out, oh. everything sticks together, and then that would be it. You wouldn't be able to get another breath in. You couldn't even, if you tried to force it in, everything just Part. Yeah, but is it possible that a baby could be carried full term and not produce surfactant? I don't think so. <laughs> I don't know. Like I what don't know of a, a disease that would cause that. Where yeah. They just wouldn't produce surfactant. I was going to say, so they would tell you, like, you had to get, like, an abortion? But can you tell something like that from the womb? Oh, yeah, right. You can tell. Yeah. You can test for it. Yeah. So, like, you don't think you can get a baby, so they 
pregnancy? If the child won't survive, there's no point in putting mom through the process of childbirth. It's too dangerous for for that. Um, if the child's not reliable. This brings us to a sticky place. This is a recent thing being passed in the law. Are they allowed to? Just say it. Uh, this is the important part here, also, this last little paragraph. The alveolar is surrounded by capillaries. It is at this level the gas exchange takes place. Carbon dioxide for oxygen, oxygen for carbon dioxide. The alveolar collectively referred to as the pulmonary parenchyma. The term parenchyma uh, simply means the functional unit of an organ. And we're at a break. So I'm going to take a break. <laughs> Basic functions of the respiratory system. A passageway for air to enter and leave the lungs. Mechanically causes air to enter the lungs when the diaphragm contracts. Warms and moistens the incoming air, traps and expels foreign particles and potential pathogens. And the ever important oxygen carbon dioxide exchange. Normally breathing is an involuntary process. You don't have to think about it. Although we do have some control over our breathing, don't we? Mm -hmm. Yes, because we can hold our breath and take deep breaths and take shallow breaths, etc. Initiation of inspiration. This is controlled by the phrenic nerve, spelled with a PH, phrenic. The phrenic nerve. The phrenic nerve is the nerve that's going to cause the diaphragm to contract. And those are bold printed and underlined as it implies some kind of upcoming importance. One inhalation, one exhalation equals one respiration. And we count those per minute in the patient. The normal respiratory rate for an adult is 12 to 20 breaths per minute. Uh, that's sort of a newer number. I've always learned the normal respiratory rate for an adult is somewhere between 16 to 18 or 18 to 20 or 16 to 20 breaths per minute. Uh, but now the newer number is 12 to 20. 12 is a little bit on the low side, but uh, that's what all the books are saying now, so we're going to go with that. 12 to 20 breaths per minute. Normal respiratory rate for a uh, little baby, an infant, is 30 to 60 breaths per minute. And we agree on that. Now, why is a baby breathing faster? The body is smaller. It's more work. It's more work. It's more work. Um, well, what do we use? Faster. The heart, what? Rate heart rate is faster. Is it, what's, why is the heart rate faster? Blood is moving blood it's around a faster. Body, so it comes back faster. We've been moving blood around quicker. Uh, how about this? What is the purpose of oxygen? No, we got to breathe. That's how we get the oxygen. What is the purpose of the oxygen? Because it goes under our red blood cell. Remember, those are the buses that are going to transport it around. And then it transports it every tissue in the body, every cell in the body needs oxygen. Mm -hmm. So what does the oxygen do once it gets inside of the cell? Helps to make energy. And Helps to make energy. And then the energy is used to build proteins. The proteins are used to build everything. So what are babies doing a lot of? Building energy. Building. Because remember, they start out small, Tiny. and then they grow from there. Up to approximately this tall, somehow. So, babies are doing a lot of growth. <coughs> a lot of things are growing. A lot of things are developing. <coughs> so they need a lot of uh, things made. So yeah, they're going to be burning through a lot of fuel. Burning through a lot of oxygen. So we, and you'll notice. Actually, um, heart rate and respiratory rate is usually uh, in correlation with one another. Of course, the blood's pumping. I'm oh, sorry, the heart is pumping the blood around. The blood's full of oxygen. Faster the breathing, faster the heart rate, faster the heart rate, faster the breathing. Okay, nobody cares. Uh, breathing has two main components. 
Internal, external respiration. Let me explain this to you very simply. Internal respiration means molecules are passing through that membrane, they're crossing the membrane. That's internal respiration. When molecules cross a membrane, it's internal. Everything else is external respiration. So air going into our nose, external respiration. Air going into our trachea, external respiration. Air going into the bronchus, can't see there, external respiration. Air going into the alveoli, external respiration. It's not until a molecule crosses a membrane. Then we call it internal respiration, that oxygen moving across the membrane. That's why I can say that technically the inside of that alveoli is still outside of the body. Right? Yes. Just like this marker, is it inside my body or outside of my body? Outside. What about now? Inside of my body or outside of my body? Still outside. Still outside. So the air going up in my nose right now, is that inside or outside of my body? Outside. Technically, those oxygen molecules are outside of my body, right? Mm -hmm. They haven't entered yet, most of them. There might be a little bit diffuses across some of the membranes, a tiny bit, but for the most part, no. So <coughs> external respiration means that it hasn't crossed the membrane. Does that make sense? Okay, let's look at some pathology when good breathing goes bad. Lungs gone wild. Uh, the first one, you've probably heard of this before, asthma. Listen to this definition of asthma. It is probably a perfect definition. I don't know if I would change a word of it. Hyperactivity that occurs suddenly of the bronchi bronchioles of bronchospasm. In other words, this is what's happening in those tubes, that muscle spasming like this, which means air cannot flow through them. Asthma is a problem with getting air out of the lungs. So that person is sitting in that tripod position. Remember like, well, let me have my back to you. Like this. Because they're trying to force that air out of their lungs. So they're breathing through those pursed lips, using all those accessory muscles to try to force the air out. And then what do we give that patient? Some kind of medication, right, that they inhale that is going to cause that smooth muscle to do this. And now the bad air can move out. which is why you can see them get that good air in afterwards. Symptoms include shortness of breath, that's what SOB stands for. Coughing, audible wheezing, mucus production. A prolonged, severe, life-threatening asthma attack, what we call status asthmatic hits, so yeah, can be dangerous. The triggers for asthma include things like an allergic reaction, cold, like cold temperatures, infection, exercise, cigarette smoke or inhaled chemicals, Stress. Note the correlation between cockroach sheddings, cockroach droppings, and asthma. This is why we see in the cities lots of kids with asthma. They used to say, oh, it's from all the pollution, the air pollution. Uh, actually, it's from all those cockroaches. They create a dander, and that creates an allergic reaction, which causes a lot of the asthma. So the best thing to do is to move out of that area. Because you can't just kill the roaches because all their stuff's still left behind. It's just going to leave. Uh, bronchitis. I'm not going to talk too much about this. I've talked about it a little bit before. Inflammation of bronchitis. Bronchitis is usually due to infection. It can be acute or chronic. Remember I said uh, there's a very specific definition for chronic bronchitis. It's not just somebody who has bronchitis every year, once a year. Uh, going through the abnormal breath sounds, normally when we're listening to breath sounds, we should hear the sound of air moving through a tunnel, basically. Uh, rails or wet rails, especially, we hear a crackling or bubbling sound. 
A strider is a high-pitched sound that you hear uh, more in the upper respiratory system. That can be in seen in croup or some sort of obstruction. Uh, wheezes, those are those squeaky sounds that we'll hear uh, more in the lower respiratory system. Oftentimes you can hear wheezing just by sitting next to the person. Looking at the top of page 86, ARDS, ARDS, Acute Respiratory Distress Syndrome or Adult Respiratory Distress Syndrome. Um, you'll notice I have here seen in burn victims. That means like people in a house fire. And this doesn't mean that they have smoke inhalation. That's different. This is from uh, inhaling superheated air. Okay, so I'm not sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Atelectasis. Uh, this is a collapsed lung. This is a collapsed lung as a result of something blocking the bronchus. <clears throat> so that airflow is not going in or out of that lung. That's all I need to know about that. It's a collapsed lung. There's other ways the lung can collapse, we'll see from the outside a little bit later on here. COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Uh, COPD includes chronic bronchitis, it includes emphysema, and it includes asthma. Not all of your textbooks will have asthma as a component of COPD, but if you ask any pulmonologist on the planet, they'll tell you asthma is a component of COPD. Well, that makes sense. Yeah, I think so. Emphys emphysema. Emphysema. The alveoli are being destroyed, so now we end up with these dead spaces where there's no um, diffusion of oxygen, so that area of the lung becomes useless. This happens in several different areas throughout the lung, so less and less of the young lung is useful. That, of course, means what? Person's not going to get as much oxygen sent throughout their body. Well, they could, yes, they would die. So, what are we going to give these patients? Oxygen. We're going to give them oxygen treatments. <clears throat> we're going to give them for the emphysema. We're going to give them oxygen. Like the tube? The nasal cannula? It goes around. They used to have to drag a tank with them. Now it's a little compressor, but you have to drag a tank around them. And oxygen is incredibly flammable, <coughs> so that was dangerous, dangerous but... Did you need to spill them? What? What? I wonder if you need to spill them from my people that had oxygen sufficient. I'm pretty sure I'm also like... People will steal anything. Yeah, that's crazy. It, it is crazy. Steal people steal everything. <laughs> I've had people steal my identity. Could you imagine that? Yes. Who would want to be me? Yes. 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 Right? Yeah. I it's mean, like they don't even know me. <laughs> Someone's like, ooh, and a he doctor. <laughs> you don't care what kind of doctor he is. <laughs> He's a doctor now. <laughs> he just skipped all that schooling. <laughs> Steal my identity when my ex is like calling them. They're like, no, here's your identity back. Uh, uh, Yes, that thirty-seven dollar that I have right there. Thirty-seven dollars. Canadian dollars. Yeah, she's good. Uh, cystic fibrosis. This is bad. Cystic fibrosis is bad. This My is sister a, has it. This is an inherited condition. Your sister has it, really? Okay, my mom has it. Wait, what? Because my mom has cystic fibrosis, and my sister has cystic fibrosis. It means your dad was a carrier of cystic fibrosis. Uh, not me, but I just said dad. No, it's, okay, her dad okay. was a carrier because it's inherited. There has to be, it's sort of like sickle cell anemia in that there has to be, a, both parents have to at least be a carrier. 
Okay. If one person has the disease and the other person is even a carrier, then none of the kids will have the disease. Well, her pops, the mama, they're just about Well, I don't, that makes it sound like she caught it. No, um, okay. Well, she didn't inherited. Say, say yeah, that's happened. not good. It creates a really thick mucus. It creates a really thick um, digestive enzymes as well. And it causes the person to have respiratory problems all their life. Yeah, so the that have, uh, Does she have a nurse? Huh? Does she have a nurse? No. Like that comes to the house on a regular basis? Well, it's that bad? Yeah, it's often that bad. They, I mean, oftentimes kids don't live to their 20s. They die in their teen years or earlier. She probably went to, I don't know, she probably went to school. I don't know if she probably went to school or after she gave birth. How could she know? She would know. That's not right. They told us that they thought it was. Yeah, something's not, yeah, I think it's, something's not right there. Well, no, I'm pretty sure I got the right one. Cystic fibrosis is diagnosed in childhood, like in the first couple of months of being alive. I don't know if she was still pregnant or after the vehicle. So, what kind of signs or symptoms does she have? I don't know. She just called me. She told me. Like, I don't know if she had. Is she a carrier or is she a disease? I don't know. Because the disease is pretty devastating. She probably is a carrier. Yeah, um, because people with the disease. Kids with the disease often have a visiting I mean, she nurse. Had a visit to the nurse. Yeah. She was her and her mom that really bad. But cystic fibrosis causes such a thick production of mucus. It also causes a really thick uh, production of digestive enzymes. So they don't, <coughs> they don't break down food very well. Mm. Oh, this girl could eat like a man. Yeah, okay. So, like a man. That's just like this. <laughs> she wanted to like, you know. <laughs> yeah, this is this is eventually fatal. Yes, people die from cystic fibrosis. Like all the time. That's what I'm trying to explain to you. Usually, people don't make it to 20 years old with cystic fibrosis. Yeah. It's terminal. Yeah. I'm trying to be nice. But. Um, I mean, now in today's world, we have people living longer. We have people living into their fifties and even sixties with it, but it's it's not common. Mm. Cystic fibrosis is scary. Most people don't realize they're a carrier with it until they have a baby that has the disease, and then they find out that both they and their spouse is a carrier. She got yeah, thanks. Uh, influenza. This is the this is the flu, also known as the Spanish flu, wiped out one percent of the world's population back in nineteen eighteen. Yeah. This is why people get flu shots. Remember, um, again, there was a time where this was pretty dangerous. Imagine this wiping out one percent of the world's population. That's a huge number of people. It'd be like the entire city of Philadelphia at that time, back in 1918. That's a lot of, a lot of people dying. So then when they have a, a, a vaccine for it, well, you would think that would make everybody happy. And they would be happy to go get a flu shot. But of course they don't. A lot of times people will say, right after I get a flu shot, I get the flu. The next day, I get the flu. The two days, I get the flu. What are they really experiencing? Flu-like flu -like symptoms. Because the body still thinks it's being attacked. So it's doing everything just as if it was being attacked, which is why they have to have a fever the next day. Because the body thinks it's under attack, so it's going to raise the temperature. So in that instance, you can um, 
<clears throat> oh, that just threw me off. Um, yeah, come back to me for my question. <laughs> okay. Right as I said that, I'm like, yeah. my brain included right, something else. Let's skip down to right in the middle of the page, Legionnaire's disease. What's this is caused by a bacterium called Legionella pneumophila. Uh, this bacterium actually survives in the water that is condensed from air conditioning units. This has a Philadelphia connection because back in 1976, a bunch of people at the American Legion Convention, or that were here for an American Legion Convention, got sick and some of them died. Many of them got sick and some of them died. And they couldn't figure out what was causing this. Uh, and part of the reason for that is because this bacterium is kind of difficult to identify. It's difficult to grow and difficult to identify. And so using just the regular staining techniques, they would be able to see them. Um, but it wasn't at the convention center. It was actually at the hotels around the convention center, especially one in particular that has since changed its name, which kind of makes sense because and this was all over time, man. Right? This was a big deal. And you don't want to be associated. You don't want to have a hotel that's associated with uh, a disease that killed a bunch of people. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm sorry? Was there I don't remember which one it was. I mean, I know it, yeah, look it up. I know it, but I don't really remember it. Um, I've actually seen it downtown. It didn't actually die there, but. Later on, when they went back to their homes or whatever, they got sick. So think about this. Um, everybody's seen uh, an air conditioning unit in the window, right? You see the water drip off of it? Yeah. Okay. So water, of course, is condensed out of the air. Now, when you cool down air, when it's really, really hot, it condenses, causes water droplets. So imagine, like, um, the air conditioning and heat ventilation air conditioning ducts that run through here. If this room was not used for weeks and weeks at a time during the summer where it was, when it was really hot and they shut the air conditioning off, this room right here, would, if it was 90 some degrees outside, it would probably be 90 degrees in here. Imagine that going on for weeks and weeks and weeks and then suddenly then turning the air conditioning on and cool air coming through those ventilation ducts. If this room temperature is 90 degrees, those ventilation um, ducts are probably 95 or 96 degrees. So as cold air comes through, that would cause condensing of that air and you get little water droplets on the sides of the walls up in that duct and they would just drip down and create little puddles. And the bacteria would survive in those puddles. And the next time they throw the air conditioning on, all that air is going to come rushing through there, pick up that bacteria and just spread it out until it just goes right up in your nose when you breathe in. And this is what happened. Now, the thing is, when people get pneumonia, we automatically assume it's a community-acquired pneumonia because that's the most likely type. And a community-acquired pneumonia is bacterial pneumonia. So how are we going to treat it? Antibiotics. So if we have a patient that comes into the hospital with a community-acquired pneumonia, we're going to put them on a broad-spectrum antibiotic until we find out for sure what's causing the problem. Well, if you put on a broad spectrum antibiotic, that's going to help a lot of bacterial infections, you know, destroy a lot of bacterial infections. So that can be enough to get the patient better to the point where they're better, they're discharged, and we never actually knew what bacteria was causing this. So this is probably something that's been around for a while, but we just never saw it in a cluster like this before. And the thing about the American Legion Convention is a lot of the people that went there were older people. Older people. So they were more susceptible. So you got a lot more people got sick, some died, and then suddenly people were like, what the hell's causing this? What's the name of the hotel? Um, it was the, the, the S. Stratford. I'm not going to The Bellevue? Bellevue Stratford? Yeah, no, it's the Bellevue. That's just the Bellevue? Yeah. Is that a killed? From July, it happened July 23rd, and from July 23rd to August 2nd, between 29 and 34 people died from it. Yeah, and imagine that, all of these people getting really sick, because that doesn't include the people that just got sick, yeah. but people got sick and some people died, That's and they'd say, what did they all have in common? They all went to that. They, they all went to this convention. It was known as the Philadelphia Fever. Wow. The PH? 
Philadelphia fever. What year was this? Philadelphia fever. 1976. 1976. That's how it got its name, Legionella pneumophila, from the American Legion Convention. People that got sick. So the reality is, a lot of times people probably got sick from this before. It was treated as a community-acquired pneumonia. They got better, and then nobody really knew which bacteria caused the problem. Uh, so it wasn't until this time they were able to actually identify. It. Part of that reason is again because the normal staining techniques that we would use, it wouldn't show up in that. You have to use a different type of stain for them to show up. What was your question? Oh, you have a question. All right. So, I tell you this because this is one that you often see showing up on different certification exams. If you, if you ever hear anything about Philadelphia 1976 air conditioning units, you know exactly where they're going. They're going for Legionnaire's disease, bacterial infection, Legionella pneumophila. Yes. Okay, lung cancer. Cancer's tumor of the lung. And saw it out. Uh, the reason for that is because all lung cancer is bad. It just goes from bad to worse. Uh, and nobody knows what causes lung cancer. <coughs> or, or do we? What causes most lung cancers? Okay. Oh, okay. Of course. Okay. Of course. Uh, however, we have these other things here. These pneumoconiosis. Pneumoconiosis is an occupational lung disorders, I'm sorry. Uh, the first one is called anthracosis, or black lung disease, also known as coal miner's lung. So who do you think is going to get this, if you had to guess? Coal miners, of course. Imagine going out of the coal mines day after day, breathing in coal dust. Some of those particles are going to get trapped in the mucus, of course, all the way down, but eventually Day after day of breathing this stuff in, eight or ten hours a day, some of it's going to get caught in those alveoli lines, it's going to start to build up. And eventually, the patient's going to die, respiratory distress. But no one cared. Why did anyone care? They didn't realize. They didn't make the connection. No, they didn't care about coal miners. <clears throat> All right. What do you need to be a coal miner? Do you need some special college degree? Yeah. Special training? No, you come out of high school, you go work in the mines. But here's the thing. You could make good money as a coal miner. Just right out of high school, you can make a living. You could buy a house, you could buy a car, send your kids to college. So when they die, there's a lot of people waiting to take the job. Nobody really cares. They're just coal miners. Who cares? However, when they would leave the coal mine, they'd be covered in coal dust. When they'd go and sit in their pickup truck, they'd leave some of that coal dust there. When they'd go and play with their kids, they'd leave some coal dust. When they'd put their clothes in the laundry, they would leave some coal dust. Mom would pick up all that laundry and put it in the, dish, in the dishwasher now. In the washing machine. <laughs> well, Mom wasn't very brave. Well, you not know you can't do <laughs> uh, Not true. I do laundry and dishes at the same time. Oh, wow. See how efficient I am. Yes. That's why my clothes are sweeping clean. One machine. One machine. Put the cat in there too. I'm not just kidding. Please, that's a joke. I wouldn't do that. You would be pissed. So, yeah. So, here's the problem. Leaving all that cool dust behind, the family to get in the pickup truck. Go to church on Sunday. Uh, mom do the laundry, getting all that coal dust. Kid playing with dad, getting the coal dust. Is that much extra coal dust? Yeah, over years, yeah. Oh, okay. And then after a while, the moms and the kids started getting black lung disease. They never set foot in a mine. Oh wow! So now people started to take notice. Nobody cared before because they're just coal miners dying. But now people started taking notice. They said, "We got to do something to protect these kids and wives." And I guess the coal miners also. This was one of the things that actually started OSHA. Have you heard of OSHA? Mm -hmm. Dr. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The coal miners was actually one of the things that started that. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, we got to look out for our employees as well. 
So anthracosis, cold miners one, asbestosis, asbestosis for breathing in small little asbestos particles, these needle-like particles. Um, asbestos is a fantastic insulator. It insulates against temperature and it insulates against sound. It is a fantastic insulator because not only does it insulate against temperature, meaning it keeps hot outside, cold inside, or cold outside, hot inside, but it also doesn't burn very easily. Hmm. And that's important because if we wanted to put insulation in this wall, we could just shred up newspaper and get shred up newspaper and stuff it in here and be a great insulator. But unfortunately, a little spark at an outlet could cause that newspaper to catch on fire, and then before you know it, the whole wall is engulfed in flames real fast. Imagine building a ship that's going to carry people out in the ocean, like an ocean liner or, or something carrying troops. If there's a little fire in one of those rooms, um, you don't want that fire to spread quickly. But you also want to make sure that the rooms are insulated against the cold temperature of the water versus the, in the occupants inside. So you want to have something that insulates really well and burns very slowly, or doesn't burn well. And that's what asbestos does. It's fantastic this way. Unfortunately, when it is in a dust form as a result of constant working with it and applying it and breaking it down, those little particles get airborne, they get breathed in. A lot of that gets stuck in the mucus, but some of it makes its way down to the alveoli where they get stuck. And the body says, well, I can't break you down, so I'm just going to build a wall around you. Well, that wall starts to irritate the cells nearby, which causes the cells to change. And what do we call that when cells change? We call that cancer. This is how it can cause a type of cancer called mesothelioma. You'll find that tiles that are in floors like this are often made with asbestos as well. But this doesn't hurt us because they're solid. It's not like it's going to leach up from the floor and into our lungs. However, if they're going to tear a building like this down, the first thing you're going to do is send in asbestos removal specialists. So anything that has asbestos is going to be taken out first. And what are those people dressed like? They are in full like body masks. Full body masks, full, full, full body suit. That they, well, when they leave, shoes, they take that suit off. off and it either gets yeah. like destroyed or special laundered. But usually I think they're mostly destroyed. Because they learn from the coal miners. They don't want to bring that stuff home to their families. And of course they don't want to breathe it in. So asbestos is still used. It's just not used. It's just really heavily regulated. Um, but it's it's a great insulator. That's why you see those commercials. Where they talk about mesothelioma victims. They'll say if somebody worked as a shipyard or a ship builder, that's why because it works great as an insulator. So then, walls. what exactly is asbestosis? Asbestosis is a condition of having asbestos in the lungs. Okay. The cancer of mesothelioma is the result of it, the long-term result, right. Gotcha. And I mean, asbestosis itself can cause um, problems with breathing because those areas are, uh, are not useful anymore. You don't have that oxygen exchange. Hmm. Hemoconiosis. Okay. Uh, pneumonia. Fluid fills the alveoli and the air passages. Inflammation usually due to infection. In summer, all the loads of the lungs cause that edema. Aspiration pneumonia. This happens when somebody <gasps> breathes some foreign particles into their lungs. One of the things that people can aspirate is vomit. <laughs> And then they breathe it in, especially if they are in a supine position or a Trendelenburg position or if they're semi-conscious. Like we see with patients who have uh, uh, undergone surgery or use general anesthesia, which can often cause a nausea and vomiting, which is why we'll tell people if you're going to have surgery, don't eat. Don't eat. This is also why we give those mothers in labor and delivery, ice chips. ice chips. We want to keep them hydrated, but minimally. We don't want them gulping down lots of water or putting any food in their stomach, anything that they can throw up and then aspirate. There's a reason why we do that. We're not just being mean. 
People think the doctors are being mean and won't let their patients eat. Mm. There's a reason for this. You don't want them to have an aspiration pneumonia. Because imagine if you're throwing up and then inhaling that stuff. Not only are you bringing a lot of bacteria into your lungs, but now you've created an environment for that bacteria to grow and grow and grow and grow. That's not good. Bacterial pneumonia. This is caused by what? Bacteria. Bacteria. How are we going to treat it? Antibiotics. Antibiotics. Well, antibiotics. Antibiotic. Antibiotic. Viral pneumonia. What causes this? Virus. Viruses. How are we going to treat it? Antiviral. Antiviral. Fungal pneumonia. What Virus. causes that? How are we going to treat it? Antiviral. Double pneumonia. Well, that's when you get pneumonia twice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's different. We're not there yet. Double pneumonia means both lungs are involved. Oh. Mm. So what's triple pneumonia? <laughs> it doesn't exist. No such thing. Trick question. Yes. Because there's no third one. Okay. PCP pneumocystis crini pneumonia. Uh, pneumocystis crini is actually now called pneumocystis gerevici. This used to be thought, initially it was thought to be, a, I think, a bacterial infection. But then it was thought to be a an amoeba, but now we know it as a fungal infection. So now it's now called pneumocystis gerevici. This is a name change that took place about five years ago. Uh, so we had known it as pneumocystis carinae. This is an important opportunistic fungal infection. I say it's important because you've been exposed to it at some point in time in your life. <gasps> oh my god. Oh my god. Then why didn't you get sick with it? Um, it's a weak, opportunistic, fungal infection. What's your immune system like? Strong. Strong. Um, Say it like strong. 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 No, strong. It's a T. No, that's wrong. Strong. The T. Strong. That's not strong. Yeah, it's strong. It's not strong. It's weak. You're strong. So, only people with a weak immune system would get sick from this. This is important to realize. Because back in the 1980s, there were men in their 30s, previously healthy, had no major health issues. We're suddenly getting sick with pneumocystis crinine pneumonia. There was no reason these guys should have gotten pneumocystis crinine pneumonia. But they were. And that said, that put up a red flag that said, we got a new problem here, ladies and gentlemen, or ladies. This was one of the things that helped to identify HIV and then AIDS. When a person has a weakened immune system, obviously in a baby, their immune system gets stronger as they get older, or of course in their elder years. But if a person has a normal immune system uh, as a young adult, there's no reason why they should have gotten some kind of a, a opportunistic infection like this, unless suddenly they developed or acquired some kind of immunodeficiency problem, which is exactly what happened. So thank goodness for pneumocystis carinae pneumonia, because without this, they probably would have missed HIV. They wouldn't have caught it as, they wouldn't have seen it as quickly. They wouldn't have seen the problem as quickly. It was a big deal in the history of the um, HIV, pneumocystis carinae, now called pneumocystis gerevici. All right, nobody cares. Uh, walking pneumonia. Now, here's a problem with walking pneumonia. It's difficult to diagnose when somebody has it. I'll show you what I mean. Over time, 
patients go from happy to sick and mad. So this is the normal course of what we'd expect um, a pneumonia to take, looking like this, up here, not down there. The patient goes from feeling fine to feeling sicker and sicker and sicker and sicker and sicker, and then eventually goes to the doctor and order the hospital and gets admitted to the hospital and gets treatment and then makes a recovery. That's what we hope for. But you see it progress something like this. With walking pneumonia, and it kind of goes like this, and they feel sicker and sicker and sicker, but not so sick that they call off work or don't go to class. They just feel miserable. They want, they like, they would like to call off work, but they, they're like, ah, I gotta make money. So they still go to work, they still go to class, and then eventually they start to get better, and then they are fine. Now, when I say that, it's difficult to diagnose walking pneumonia while they have it, because we can't really diagnose it right here. Because at this point in time, they still might not have gone to the doctors yet. They might still, like I said, still be at that point where they're like, I feel miserable, but I'm going to go to work. I need to get some work done, blah, blah, blah. Can't really diagnose it here because there's still the potential that it could get worse and then they can go to the hospital and get admitted and follow the rest of this route. So it's not until, like here, where they start to get better, we can look backwards on it and say the disease progressed this way. It didn't actually get so far as having to be hospitalized and get treatment that way. But it, it just got to about this point and then they started getting better. Then you can look back on it and say, well, the patient had walking pneumonia. Um, Does that make sense? Yeah. So you don't know until you can't You can't um, really diagnose it until the patient starts to get better. Because at any point here, they could still get worse and it could become pneumonia. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I know people will say, well, I was diagnosed with walking pneumonia while I still had it. Uh, you were probably here, though. You were probably on the mend when you were diagnosed with it. It wasn't full-blown pneumonia. He wants to go on a break. Really? Full-blown? Because <sighs> I say... She said we were supposed to laugh. <laughs> you were, and you didn't. Great time. You know how much I hate that phrase. Wait, is it recording? Yes. Um... You remember the cardiovascular system is a circulatory system. So if blood backs up in one area, for instance, if the left side of the heart isn't pumping the blood out very well, then blood that's returning to the left side of the heart is going to be from the lungs, which means it's going to back up into the lungs. So as you have blood backing up into the lungs, you're going to have fluid that is going to leak out of the blood and collect around the alveoli. Those patients will say that when they're lying down, they feel like they're going to drown, or they feel like they can't breathe, they have to sleep in a recliner, or they sleep using like three pillows, elevate their head. And then pulmonary embolism is next, right? Yeah. Okay. Things to remember. A thrombus is a clot, stationary. An embolus is a traveling clot. A thrombus is a stationary clot. But if that clot is stationary in a leg vein, big, deep vein in the leg, and part of that clot or the whole clot breaks off, it's going to travel with the vein back to the heart. And it's going to travel back to the right side of the heart, which then is going to pump that blood to and through the lungs. 
So depending upon how big that clot is, it's going to get stuck somewhere as it's going through those pulmonary uh, arterioles or pulmonary capillaries, or pulmonary arteries even, if it's big enough. And that will cause that part of the lung to be useless. So blood going through there won't be getting any oxygen, yes. Is it the whole clot or just parts of the clot? Either one. The whole clot can break off, parts of the clot can break off. Break off. But they're going to travel with the blood. Yeah, just like throwing a stick into a river. It's just going to travel in the direction of flow. And if it's in a vein, remember all veins take blood back to the heart. So if it's in a vein, it's going to travel back to the right side of the heart. And the right side of the heart pumps blood over to and through the lungs, so it's going to travel along with it. And then it's going to get stuck somewhere in there. And this is dangerous, this is deadly. If it's big enough, it could block a whole lung, it could block both lungs. It could get caught right here. It all sat on the line, block both lungs. The person would be dead in a few minutes. Do you have to have surgery to get it? Well, this is one of the reasons why when a person is in the hospital, like when she delivers a baby, before she leaves, check we check her ankles, her legs, her calves to see if there's any heat. Swelling, tenderness, anything that could indicate clot formation, as well as check her breathing, make sure that there isn't already a clot that has traveled and moved along. Once it gets stuck in there, it's kind of stuck. You can't like go in and fish it out. So we have to, like, it's just what you want Now, in some cases, they can use <coughs> clot busting medications. Oh. Thrombolytics. But in other cases, like I said, it could just be too late for her to die. Understand though, an embolus, this traveling clot, doesn't have to be just like a blood clot. It could be air. This is why, you know when you give injections, you always make sure you get all the air out of it. Don't go squirting that stuff out onto the floor. That's expensive uh, medication. But when you see people that are getting a little bit of air out, what happens is if you start giving people injection, and you're injecting them regularly, like if they're in a hospital, for instance, uh, if there's a little air bubble in that, probably one little air bubble is not really going to hurt the patient much. It was just a one small little air bubble. But imagine if they get another injection with another little air bubble, another one, another one, another one. Those air bubbles kind of come together. And it become a bigger air bubble, and that could get stuck. Uh, fat can also travel as an embolus. You see this in patients when they have fractures, like a um, person driving a car and they hit something, front end collision, their legs get pushed back, it breaks here, it breaks here, it breaks here. Uh, the fat that's in that bone get into the blood. And that fat could travel as an embolus. We see this with bullet fragments. People get shot, part of a bullet enters into a vein, it could travel with the blood. Even the bullet itself, in some cases, a small bullet could travel with the blood and become a clot. Oh, wow. So an embolus doesn't just have to be a blood clot, it could be other things. Oh. That's why you'll hear about fat in water or air in water, for instance. Okay, on the top of page 87, tuberculosis. Tuberculosis is caused by a bacterium called Mycobacterium tuberculosis. These patients are going to be coughing up blood. It is a bacterial infection, however, so we're going to treat it with a uh, triple antibiotic therapy for six to nine months, the CDC recommendation. And then you ask, what is your question, Sarah? Oh, um, just quick, you can just answer real fast. So is that the same thing with like a brain aneurysm when you air it in the brain or something? Or is that completely different? That's different. Okay. Is that fast enough? Yeah, we can just talk about it later. <laughs> so we stay for a little bit. Yeah, aneurysm is uh, when part of an artery sort of balloons out. Kind of imagine it like an inner tube tire that you're filling up with air, and one weak area sort of bubbles out a little bit. Okay. That's kind of what's happening with an aneurysm. Oh. And it always it happens in arteries because they're under pressure. And the problem with that is if that aneurysm tears the rupture, the blood can become 
pumping out of it, which means now it runs not the way where it's supposed to go. Internal Internal Yeah, I don't think I'm here to bring it. But she lives, so. Yeah, it's very commonly occurs at the base of the brain, in the circle of wills, um, or in the aorta, thoracic aorta, or abdominal aorta. Dangerous. Uh, hemothorax, pneumothorax. Here is a collection of blood or air, respectively, occurring outside of the lung. That's putting pressure, so the person breathes out, the lung collapses as they try to breathe back in. It does not fill back up the air. Well, the um, pressure from the outside of the lung is pushing on it. Pressing the lung. Obstructive sleep apnea, spontaneous respiration during sleep are absent. Talked a little bit about that before. Dyspnea, difficult or painful respirations. What do we call it when people have fast respirations? Tachypnea. Tachypnea. Not tachypnea. Tachypnea. And what about um, excessive breathing? More than normal. Uh, crap, what's the name? It's not hypo. Not, um, it's hyper. hyper. So what's that called? Hyperpnea. Uh, anoxia, total lack of oxygen, <laughs> arterial blood, that's bad. How can a person have total lack of oxygen in arterial blood? Well, patients with carbon monoxide poisoning, for instance, carbon monoxide, that's that gas that's breathed in from car exhaust or from a furnace that doesn't ventilate the water of the house. It'll kick oxygen out. That's bad. Uh, hypoxemia. Uh, Chances are most people in here at some point in your life have had hypoxemia, low levels of oxygen, arterial blood. Um, if you have asthma, if you've had pneumonia, even chronic bronchitis or bronchitis, um, there's probably a time where you had lower levels of oxygen, in arterial blood. ADGs, arterial blood gas. We're going to take blood from an artery rather than a vein to get. Um, good representation of what the oxygen carbon dioxide looks like in the blood. Pulse oximetry, that's that little clip they put on your finger to measure the amount of oxygen molecules bound to hemoglobin in your blood. Comes off as a percent. So on room air right now, you should have somewhere between 98 and 100 oxygen. You should have between 98 and 100. Close to 100. If you have less than 90, they won't they won't let you out of the hospital. I mean, you can leave anytime you want. It's all a prison, but they won't I'll release you. Endotracheal intubation. It's using a laryngoscope. We insert this plastic tube that creates a patent airway, open airway. This is done if a person has a compromised airway. Or if a person is undergoing surgery where they're under general anesthesia, mm -hmm. we have to intubate them in order so they can breathe, yes. A nasal cannula. I'm never going to test you on this, but this is that little two-pronged hose that goes up the nose and removes oxygen. I just don't want you to call it a nose hose. Mm -hmm. Nasal cannula. Anti tussle drugs suppress the cough center in the brain. Why do we cough? Get yeah. things out that shouldn't be there, right? So that's a good thing. Fortunately, people can cough too much. You know this. If you've had a cold, you've been coughing for three days straight, your chest is really hurting just from using all those muscles in your head. Um, so we give you something to suppress the cough. And the person takes this medication, and they take the medication, and they say, a few minutes later, 10 minutes later, they say, I can feel it working, it's coating my throat, it makes it feel like it's sort of numb. But the reality is, it's turning off the cough center in the brain. Oh. It's not actually affecting the throat. 
Those are anti-tussle drugs. And then expectorant drugs decrease the thickness of the sputum and allow the person to effectively cough it up and out. They expect to cough up a bunch of green stuff with an expector, right? Mm -hmm. Or yellow, or brown, or a mixture of all those colors. Which is nice. Okay, we're going to move on. Any questions with the respiratory system? We understand it fully and completely. Thank you.